On the 25th of November 2001, a month after the start of the US-led invasion of Afghanistan, CIA agents David Tyson and Johnny Spann were deployed to Kali Jangi, a 19th century fort on the outskirts of Mazari Sharif that was being used as a makeshift prison for Taliban insurgents and was administered by the Northern Alliance, which was a military front made up of various Afghan factions who had been fighting the Taliban since 1996 and became a key ally of the US during the invasion. On their arrival in the late morning, Tyson and Spam began interrogating hundreds of Taliban prisoners of war who were sat with their hands bounded behind their backs in the fort's southern courtyard and guided by a handful of Afghan fighters from the Northern Alliance. Just meters away was a pink colored building holding a dozen more Taliban prisoners, many of whom had concealed grenades and light weapons from the guards underneath their clothing. For two hours, the interrogations, which aimed to identify who were members of Al-Qaeda, progressed relatively undisturbed, until shouting and gunfire could be heard from inside the pink building, as the Taliban prisoners inside rose up against the Afghan guards, stole their rifles, and ran out into the courtyard where they began sporadically firing into the direction of the two US agents, who, despite being heavily outnumbered, drew their weapons and began fighting back. However, within minutes, both agents were overwhelmed as hundreds of Taliban insurgents rushed for them, with Johnny Spam being killed in the ensuing close quarter fighting and his colleague David Tyson barely escaping from the area as he ran to the safety of a building at the northern edge of the fort. Here he met a German journalist who handed Tyson a satellite phone which he used to contact the US Embassy in Uzbekistan and requested that reinforcements be sent to the area as the 100 guards of the Northern Alliance were facing 400 to 500 Taliban prisoners who had by now seized the fort's main armory and were well equipped. Responding to Tyson's call for help, the United States Central Command dispatched a combined US and UK Special Forces group stationed in a safe house in the outskirts of Mazari Sharif with the main objective of extracting the two US agents from the fort. This group, commanded by Major Mark Mitchell of the US Special Forces, consisted of 10 US Green Berets from the 3rd Battalion, the 5th Special Forces group, a handful of CIA operatives, two US Air Force liaison officers, seven British operators from M Squadron, the Special Boat Service, and Chief Petty Officer Stephen Bass, a US Navy SEAL from SEAL Team 1 who was temporarily attached to the Special Boat Service. Leaving the safe house just after 1300, the force, consisting of two Land Rovers, each mounted with a general purpose machine gun to their roof, and two minibuses, headed to Kali Jangi, arriving at the fort's main entrance a little under an hour later, when the men on board exited the vehicles and were briefed on the situation by a commander of the Northern Alliance. Following the briefing, Major Mitchell deployed his men accordingly, with the SBS and Green Berets to secure the central eastern tower from where they could control both the southern and northern sections of the fort, whilst the two Air Force liaison officers were to direct airstrikes onto the Taliban positions. Making their way up the staircase, the SBS operators and Green Berets reached the roof of the tower, where they found several Afghan fighters of the Northern Alliance already in positions along the tower wall and so moved up alongside them and began engaging the Taliban insurgents located below. Not long into the firefight did a couple of the SBS operators realise that heavier weapons were needed if they were to attain fire superiority, and subsequently two of them returned to the Land Rovers, detached the two GPMGs from their roofs, and brought them up to the top of the tower. Almost immediately on their return, screams could be heard from the courtyard, as dozens of Taliban insurgents charged into the northern section intent on not only seizing complete control over the fort, but also aiming to break out into the nearby villages. Realising what was unfolding, Sergeant Paul McGow and one of his colleagues, both the SBS, hauled the machine guns up to the tower wall and proceeded to pour heavy fire into the enemy formation, causing heavy casualties amongst the Taliban and breaking up the attack. Directly behind them, the two US Air Force officers had established communications with several FA-18 Super Hornets, which were taken off from a US aircraft carrier stationed in the Arabian Sea. Using lasers and map coordinates, the officers guided the first Hornet onto the target, with the first 500 pound Joint Direct Attack Munition, or JDAM, being dropped onto the Taliban held southern section just after 1600. This would be followed over the course of the remainder of the evening by a further seven more JDAMs, one of which mistakenly landed in a set of fields outside of the fort's walls. Meanwhile, Major Mark Mitchell had rallied a small team of British, American and Afghan troops to move around and secure the building at the northern side of the fort, which he had been told was the last known position of David Tyson. 
After running through a hail of enemy fire in an active minefield, the team reached the building, where they were told that Tyson had already managed to get out of the fort and make it back to Mazari Sharif in an Afghan taxi. His colleague Johnny Spann, however, was still unaccounted for. On hearing this, Chief Petty Officer Stephen Bass, the Navy SEAL who was with Mitchell's group, took the initiative himself to try and locate Spann, making his way under enemy fire to the central western tower, from where he got eyes on a body lying in the southern section, wearing clothes that matched the description of Spann's. With this, he returned to the rest of his team and reported his discovery, before they made their way back to the fort's main entrance and rejoined the others in the central eastern tower, where the US-UK Special Forces group remained throughout the night, continuing to engage the Taliban insurgents and observing the arrival of reinforcements, which the Northern Alliance were beginning to pour into the area. Early the next morning on the 26th of November, the British and American troops used a brief pause in the fighting to redeploy to new positions, with one team of Green Berets and SBS securing the Central Western Tower, and another including the two Air Force officers, establishing themselves in the tower to the northeast, where the Northern Alliance had deployed 30 or so fighters and a T-55 tank. Additionally, as the fighting restarted, they were joined by four more operators from the US Special Forces and a squad of eight infantrymen from the 10th Mountain Division the latter remaining outside the fort's perimeter, acting as the quick reaction force for the Afghan forces. It was just before 1100 on the 26th that the Air Force officers in the Northeast Tower made contact with the Uncle Air Support, which came in the form of a handful of carrier-borne F-14 Tomcats, each carrying a 2,000-pound JDAM bomb. Guided in by the Air Force officers, the first F-14 dropped its JDAM, with the target being the pink coloured building that had been identified to be the main centre of resistance for the Taliban. Tragically, instead of hitting the designated target, the bomb smashed into and detonated on the northeastern tower, destroying the T-55 tank, killing and wounding over 20 Northern Alliance fighters, and wounding to various degrees 5 US and between 2 and 4 British soldiers. What exactly had caused this error isn't clear, although a US Central Command post-operational investigation concluded that it was a series of Procedural errors in the transmission and application of friendly and enemy coordinates. A Green Beret who was present at the time later elaborated on this point, stating that That was the fault of the guy who passed the coordinates to the pilot from the ground. Apparently he sent his own position instead of the target, which was a few hundred meters away. Nonetheless, as the smoke began to clear from the tower, the wounded were pulled free from the rubble, with the most seriously injured being loaded up onto a convoy of vehicles waiting outside the fort and driven a safe distance away from where they were picked up by a US helicopter and airlifted to a nearby hospital. At the same time, having suffered heavy casualties in the blast, the Special Forces Group withdrew back to the safe house, where it became clear that of the approximate 9 US and UK operators who had been caught up in the blast, only one, an American, was severely wounded. The other operators, remarkably, had walked off with only minor injuries, which were seen to by several medics. Consequently, Major Mitchell decided that the group would return to the fort the next morning to complete its mission of recovering Johnny Spann. Until then, two AC-130 gunships arrived on the scene at midnight on the 26th of November and began pounding the Taliban positions, with one of the strikes hitting the Taliban-held ammunition building, causing a huge explosion. The next day, at around 10.00 on the 27th of November, the US-UK Special Forces Group returned to Kali Jangi, from where they took up positions on the fort's walls and provided covering fire to a ground assault by the Northern Alliance, which aimed to break the Taliban resistance and retake the southern end of the fort. Advancing through the central gateway, an Afghan T-55, with infantry in close support, began firing its main gun against the pink building, forcing the insurgents inside to seek cover in the basement from where they made their last stand against numerous Northern Alliance attacks, all of which they repulsed. Meanwhile, in the courtyard, several Afghan fighters recovered the body of Johnny Spann and transferred him over to US forces for repatriation to America. He would be buried on the 10th of December 2001 with full military honours. By the 28th of November 2001, the majority of the Taliban resistance had been overcome with approximately 100 insurgents of the original 400 to 500 still alive and holding out in the basement of the pink building. Despite every attempt by the Northern Alliance to get this last pocket to surrender, the insurgents continued to hold out fiercely, until the basement was purposely flooded with freezing cold water to flush them out. 
However, it wouldn't be until the 1st of December 2001 that the insurgents, a total of 86, finally emerged from the basement and made their way out to the courtyard, where they gave themselves up to the fighters of the Northern Alliance, following seven days of intense fighting. <laughs>